Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 2. Last week, the Lord was in a house in Capernaum, was filled with people. They listened to him speak when a paralytic was brought in in a very unusual way. The Lord forgave him his sins, and then he enabled him to walk, and that caused quite a controversy with the scribes who were there. And now we continue in verse 13 through verse 17. And he went out again by the seashore, and all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them, and they were following him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. We've all heard it said that one man's trash is another man's treasure. And we've heard stories of people who have found riches lost among junk. You've probably seen them on the Antiques Roadshow. Jesus told a parable about that, the pearl of great price, about a merchant who saw something valuable that everyone overlooked. So. He sold all that he had in order to buy that treasure. But sometimes it's not a treasure. Sometimes one man's trash is just that, what no one wants. That's the story of Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, when Jesus called Levi. He was what no one wanted, but Jesus did and transformed him into a treasure. That's what Christ does. He makes us new. He does remarkable things. As we follow the account in chapter 2, Jesus has just done something remarkable. He forgave a man's sins. No one can do that but God alone. That was, in fact, the complaint of the scribes who were sitting in the house where this occurred and who were observing it all. So to prove to them that he did have the authority to forgive, he healed the forgiven man. He made the paralytic walk. And everyone in the house was amazed. But forgiveness is not the end for the forgiven for the child of God. It's really the beginning. The forgiven follow Christ. And the next incident is an example of that and how it happens when Jesus called a tax collector to be his disciple. And once again, he scandalized the scribes. It all happened in Capernaum. The house where Jesus healed the paralytic was stuffed with people and no doubt stuffy and would have been, I'm sure if I were there, quite claustrophobic. So we read, he went out again by the seashore. That would have given him a breath of fresh air with the breeze from the sea, as well as it would have diffused the tension that existed there with the scribes. But he wasn't there long before the people sought him out, and he was again teaching them. Rabbis and philosophers would often teach as they walked in the open air, 
and along the roads or in the marketplaces and they would talk to their disciples and to their students who would listen to them. And as Jesus walked along the sea teaching, he came to a tax booth and to a certain tax collector. Galilee was a place where you would find such people. Um, it was uh, located on the major roads and had a lot of traffic. Someone, in fact, said Judea is on the way to nowhere. Galilee is on the way to everywhere. It was a poor part of that region of the world, but nevertheless, it was a place of commerce, a place of highways. A highway went from the Mediterranean Sea to Damascus and ran right through Capernaum. So it was a natural place for a customs booth, some place between the town and the River Jordan. When the Lord came to it, when he came to this tax booth, he saw Levi. That's how he is identified in both the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke. But he's also known to us as Matthew. That's how he is identified in the first Gospel which he wrote. And it's not uncommon, as you well know, for Jews to have more than one name. Already in this Gospel, Peter is called Simon. In fact, in John chapter 1, he's, he is called Cephas. So he's Peter, he's Simon, he's Cephas, Thomas was also Didymus, Paul was Saul, Matthew was also Levi. He was a tax collector, he was a businessman, and most likely he was a ruthless one. Such was the way of the tax man in Roman times. He got rich in his business and he got rich at the expense of his fellow countrymen. I don't think anyone enjoys paying taxes, working all year saving up your hard-earned dollars, then finding that you have to give more to the government this year than you gave last year. That's a difficult thing to do. Americans have a, a notorious history with taxes. They were uh, the pretext for the revolt against England. We all learned that very early on when we were learning American history and all about the Boston Tea Party and the, the taxes on tea and everything that uh, that led to. Taxation has fomented revolution, certainly in our history. But under Roman rule, it was especially onerous, particularly in a hard scrabble place like Galilee. Since Levi worked in Galilee, he probably served the king. So the money he raised from the, the customs he collected on the highway and by the sea went into the treasury of Herod Antipas. But whether he worked for Caesar or worked for Herod, the, the business was very lucrative for anyone who could get the job. A man was required to, to uh, tax uh, a fixed sum or toll but then he would add to that amount whatever he wanted for his own personal profit. And, and that could be, as you would imagine, very high. He had the authority of the state behind him. He could enforce all of that. And so while collecting for the king or for Caesar, he would then add to that what would go into his pocket. And the result was tax men became very wealthy and quite hated by the people. When a Jew entered that service, he was regarded as an outcast from society. He was considered an extortionist. He was disqualified as a judge or even a witness in a court of law. He was excommunicated from the synagogue. And his disgrace in the eyes of the community was extended to his family for all those associated with him. Ancient inscriptions have been found in... Asian cities around the eastern rim of the Mediterranean of the toll on fish. So around the Sea of Galilee and in Capernaum there may have been a tax on fish that were caught. 
And if so, it's likely that Levi knew the fishermen that accompanied Jesus when he approached the tax booth. He would not have been anyone's favorite, except Jesus. He saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Jesus wanted the man that no one wanted. And you can imagine Peter and John looking at each other and say, you're kidding, him? He didn't talk to me about who this man was, didn't talk to you, did he? And no, of course he didn't. He doesn't seek our counsel on those that he chooses. He chooses according to his own will. And so Jesus called and Levi followed right then and for the rest of his life. It was that simple. But it was not without sacrifice. Luke tells us what Mark left out, that Levi left everything behind. When Christ called him, he left a lucrative business, so profitable that men would have sold their souls to have it. But he left it all without hesitation and without looking back. So Luke tells us. Mark didn't mention that. And what's particularly interesting, I think, is Matthew didn't either. We might have expected Matthew to be the one that gave that very significant detail to inform everyone of the great sacrifice that he made to follow Jesus. He left everything behind. Um, maybe Matthew didn't record that because he didn't consider it much of a sacrifice. Gaining Christ and life everlasting was worth far more than anything he left, more than the whole world. Matthew or, or Levi knew he really didn't lose anything. He gained everything. He lost money, but he found true riches, eternal wealth where moth and rust don't destroy. Levi, of all people, had found the pearl of great price, or rather was found by the pearl. And what a life he gained here in this world. Christ took him from being a tax collector to being an evangelist, a writer of one of the greatest books in the world. It's not a bad exchange. Interestingly, after his call in verse 14, and the banquet that he gave for Jesus in verse 15, we only read his name on the list of disciples in chapter 3, verse 18. And there his name is listed as Matthew. But his ministry isn't recorded. This is all we have of him in this gospel. Alexander McLaren called it a happy fate to be known to all the world for all time only by this one thing that he unconditionally, immediately, and joyfully obeyed Christ's call. Well, that's true. That's not a bad thing to be remembered by. And he's an example to us in his immediate response. Though it's not necessary that a person leave his or her possessions to follow Christ. The greatest, the greatest witness of the church occurs with the Christian secretary or businessman in the office or the doctor or lawyer in the clinic or the courtroom or the laborer in the factory being faithful, being a representative of Christ there. The greatest witness of the church occurs with Christians being what they are to be, being a light wherever they are. And God, in His providence and wisdom, has placed us strategically throughout the world and throughout society. At all levels of society, He has His people to be a light to those that are there. Living among the unbelievers in the home, at work, so that they can see and hear and learn of Christ. So it's not necessary 
that we leave our profession to follow Christ. It's necessary that we live for Him where we are. My older brother once met Donald Gray Barnhouse. My father was an acquaintance of Dr. Barnhouse's and he would come to Kansas City and hold meetings. And so my father once brought my brother to meet Dr. Barnhouse and he sat at a table with uh, Dr. Barnhouse as he did a radio broadcast and then they had a bit, little visit, a little conversation and uh, he asked my brother what he wanted to be when he grew up and my brother was probably 12 years old at the time and he said he wanted to be a doctor which he became. And Barnhouse said to him, then be a doctor to the glory of God. And that's good advice. That's good counsel. That's following Christ. But sometimes God does call people out of their profession to serve Him in a, a full-time capacity in the ministry. Dr. Johnson left the insurance business to become a professor and preacher. Another was David Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, the great London preacher. He was often spoken of as the doctor because he was trained as a medical doctor and he had a brilliant career before him. As a young man he became chief assistant to Thomas Horder who was the physician to the King of England. But he left all of that to become a country preacher in a small church in Wales. He was criticized for that as you can imagine he might be but he said he'd come to realize that as a doctor he was spending most of his time rendering people fit to go back to their sin. He wanted to do more than that. He wanted to heal souls. So he left a promising practice on Harley Street in London. That's where all, uh, the best doctors have their offices on Harley Street. He left all of that to become a minister of the gospel. Now, now he knew it was good to be a doctor. He knew it was good to be a physician. But he said, we have sometimes to give up those things which are good for that which is best of all. And sometimes it means leaving a profession. And again, it's not necessary for people to leave a profession to follow Christ. And generally I think it's not desirable. What is necessary is a break with the world, with a love of the world. Paul said in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. When he was saved on the Damascus road, he was a rising star within Judaism. He was the right hand man, as it were, of the chiefs, the priests, the chief priests and the Pharisees and all of that. He was Gamaliel's star student. The world, as it were, the world that Paul lived in, loved him, admired him. But when he was changed on the Damascus road, he was crucified to the world. They had no use for Paul. He was an outcast. But Paul, well, the world was crucified to him as well. He was no longer enamored of the things of the world that charm us so much. It was crucified to Levi as well. He followed Christ, which means he believed in Him and obeyed Him. This isn't the life of a committed believer. This is not the life of a committed believer. It is the life of a believer. Believers in Jesus Christ follow Christ. But they do that by grace alone. None of what Paul, or rather what Mark is describing here, is anything in one's own ability, in one's own strength. Notice how Mark describes this. Notice what he wrote. As he passed by, he saw Levi and said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. It's all Christ. He comes, he passes by, he sees, he speaks, he calls, he takes the initiative, and his words are effective. Not because he was so charismatic, but because he is God. 
He does the same with us through the Holy Spirit who speaks inaudibly in our hearts, in our minds to call us to salvation and we respond because God's grace is irresistible ultimately. We may resist for a moment, but ultimately it is irresistible. It's God who is working within us to bring this about. And it is life changing. Levi was a changed man. He got the spirit, the mind, the attitude of Christ. Christ called him and he in turn called others to meet Christ. He gave a party in which Jesus was the guest of honor and he invited his friends. The way Mark tells it, it was a large banquet with lots of people reclining and dining. When Martin Luther decided to leave law school and enter an Augustinian monastery and become a monk, he gave a farewell party for his friends. They, they dined and he gave away his law books and he said goodbye to them. Well, that's something like this taking place with Levi. It was a way of, uh, of saying that he was leaving his old life. That's what Luther did, by the way. He left his old life, he entered a new life, but really, even then, it wasn't full and complete because he spent the next number of years searching and struggling until he said goodbye to monkery and then followed Christ altogether. Well, Levi, as I say, was doing that here. He gave a kind of farewell dinner to say goodbye to his old life, celebrate his new life, and introduce his friends to Christ. And many came. They were colleagues at the tax office and other people from what we would call the fringe of society. They were the, the great unwashed in terms of the spiritual men of that day, the, the religious leaders of that day. So it was a house full of people that no one wanted. But Jesus wanted them. He sat down and he dined with them with tax collectors and sinners. Mark says there were many of them. And he says they were following him. They were drawn to Christ. They were drawn to his warmth and care. They were rejected by men. They were pariahs in society. But they knew he loved them. It gives the lie to the notion that Jesus was a dreary person. The English poet Charles Swinburne was a, a neo-pagan and a uh, and who propagated that idea of our Lord. He called Jesus the pale Galilean and accused him of robbing life of its joy. The world has grown gray from my breath, he wrote. Well, not to those who met him. He makes life fresh for them and new and clean. He gives order to life. He brings forgiveness to those who are weighed down with guilt. No one can do that but Jesus Christ. What a picture Mark gives. Jesus was reclining at the table in Levi's house and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples for, they were, for there were many of them and they were following him. That's a picture of the Christian life. It is feasting with Jesus Christ. It's not a frivolous party, but neither is it gray or gloomy. It, it is a feast. It is joy. It is nourishment. That's what Christ offers. What Christ offers is the best life, the very best life. A life that's far better than sitting behind a tax booth and collecting money. It's a beautiful picture. Jesus sitting with sinners. But not everyone liked it. The, the scribes were back, those men who were so offended that Jesus would forgive sins. They were outside the house looking in and unhappy with what they saw. They pulled the Lord's disciples aside and they asked, Why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? 
They, they weren't seeking information here from the disciples. They were lodging a complaint. They were offering criticism. These are the guys who turn the world gray, who smother joy out of life. Religion or religionists with their heavy burdens of works that they place on others but don't lift with their own finger. They're men of pride. They're men of condescension. These are, are, are men who have no sense of grace, no sense of their own worth, or rather their lack of worth, no sense of their own need of a Savior. Therefore, no personal humility and really no care for others. People hate to hear about sin because it means they're guilty and unworthy. They hate to hear that, they're, that they are living in a lost condition. They certainly don't like to hear about the doctrine of total depravity, which, as I've explained, doesn't mean that we are, are totally as corrupt as we could be, but rather that we are totally infected with sin and we're lost. People don't like to hear that. They don't like to hear that at all. They rise up against that from the very core of their being because man in and of himself is proud, so proud that, that, that he lies to himself to maintain the fantasy that he's okay, really. He really worth something, really worthy in and of himself when the opposite is really true. And, and, and if that bothers you, the idea that you are unworthy, beware. These men, the scribes and the Pharisees, are what you will become. Self-righteous, self-important, and uncaring. The irony of this is these, these men were supposedly the shepherds of God's flock. They, they should have been out looking for the lost sheep and seeking to care for the spiritual needs of sinners. Instead, they, they had disdain for them, for all who didn't keep the rituals as they did, didn't observe the traditions that they had formulated, and were offended that Christ would enter the home of a person like Levi and his friends. That's like doctors censoring a physician for making a house call. I used to make that when I was a boy. Probably some of you remember that too. I'd get be sick and the doctor would come over. I can remember Dr. Macer coming over with his big bag and he had things inside of it like tongue depressors and thermometers and needles, which I always had the privilege of being injected with something. They would come to the house in those days. And so the complaint here is it's like a doctor saying, what are you doing visiting the sick, going to their house? Well, I'm a doctor. I go to those who need me. That would be the proper response. And that's really the analogy that, that Jesus makes in verse 17 where he likens himself to a doctor and sinners to the sick. And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. The sick need medicine and sinners need mercy. He came to give that as the great physician. But he wasn't suggesting that the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees were healthy. They needed what uh, only he could give, every bit as much as the tax men and the prostitutes did. The scribes and the Pharisees were not as healthy as they thought they were. They were moralists. They were men who thought they could offer to God true obedience. They thought they could, uh, by their, their traditions and their way of living, they could gain merit before the Lord, not realizing that they were what Jesus would later call them, Tombs full of bones, corrupt. Martin Luther regarded moralism, good works without the fear of the Lord, morality without faith, morality done in the flesh to be idolatry and blasphemy. That may seem strong, but I think that's absolutely correct. These men who hated idols were idolaters. Idolaters. 
The scribes and the Pharisees were not healthy. They were sick. In fact, they were far beyond sick. They were spiritually dead. So they didn't understand the mission of the Messiah. They were, they were looking as the popular idea was at that time for a Messiah who was a conqueror, who would crush sinners and elevate the righteous, meaning law keepers, meaning them. That's the kind of Messiah they wanted. One who would reward their deeds and not rebuke their hypocrisy. They didn't want the kind of Messiah that Jesus was. But the kind of Messiah Jesus was and is answers the slander they made against him. He, he didn't associate with sinners because he was okay with sin. He wasn't eating and drinking with them because he enjoyed their company, though he probably found it more enjoyable than being with the scribes. He mixed with sinners because they were sinners. Just as a good doctor would be found among the sick because they are sick. Jesus wasn't socializing. He was ministering. He was with them to heal them. And they responded to that. They were drawn to him. He had made enemies of the religious establishment because he forgave sinners and associated with them. But the outsiders followed him. The tax collectors and sinners followed him just like they did David, the Lord's ancestor according to the flesh and a type of the Lord as the King and Messiah. In 1 Samuel 22 verses 1 and 2, we have a picture of what uh, I think Mark records here. It's, it's, it's after David had, flee, had fled from Saul for the final time. He's driven out. The king was threatening his life. So David escaped by fleeing to Gath and the Philistines. He thought he'd be safe there with the enemy, but he was driven away from there as well. So he went to the region of Judah and found refuge in a cave in Adullam, which is just south of Bethlehem. He was alone. He was rejected, rejected by everyone, rejected by the Philistines, rejected by his own king, rejected by the princes of Israel. He was alone. But when his family heard he was there, his brothers came to him, and then others began coming to him and joined him there. In fact, the text says, everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him and he became captain over them. There were about 400 men who gathered to him at that cave. This was the Lord's doing. He gave David a small army which soon increased to an army of 600. The oppressed, the discouraged, literally the bitter of soul, that's what the word means when they're described as uh, distressed. They were coming to David. They were, they were the debtors. They were the disaffected. They were people dissatisfied with Saul's rule because his rule had become so oppressive against them. So they found their hope in David and came to him and he received all of them and they were accepted by him. It was a ragtag band of malcontents and outcasts, but out of them God raised up David's mighty men, an army of loyal, courageous soldiers, good soldiers. That's what God does. It's the same with those that Jesus found and called and dined with here. He called a tax collector who was hated by all and made him an apostle and the author of the first gospel. He went to sinners and made them saints. He loved them. Because he loved them, they were enabled to love him and follow him and become the core of the early church, witnesses and, and warriors for the Lord. That's what he does. He makes 
us into something completely new and different. He, he takes the unpromising and makes us whole and valuable. Sons and daughters of God. He finds the off-scouring in the rubble of fallen humanity and he makes it a genuine treasure. That's what, what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26. There are not many of us wise according to the flesh. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And then he makes them wise. Truly wise with the wisdom of God. What the world rejects, he seeks and finds and transforms. He makes us like himself, like the pearl of great price. And what is he like? We see it here. He was warm and kind and no respecter of persons. He didn't seek the wealthy, the lofty, the beautiful. That's what the world does. He wanted the unwanted. Well, may the Lord make us like that. Increasingly give us His mind so that we go to those who need a word of encouragement or a word of wisdom so that we give help to the discouraged and the desperate. That's what Christ did when He called Levi. And then that's what Levi did when He called His friends, the tax collectors and sinners, and introduced them to Christ. We can do no greater service than that to introduce people to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. So if there's anyone here who has not met our Lord, we, we hope you've been introduced to Him here in this passage and, and that you'll see Him in our lives. He's perfect, we're not. He's God. And He does astonishing things. He forgives sins altogether and He calls us to come after Him and follow Him. He changes us and will someday glorify us and make us perfect. If you want that, then do what Levi did. Get up and follow Him. You will find that when you do that, you really have left nothing at all, nothing of value, and you have gained everything. You may have lost the world, but you've gained your soul and eternal life in the world to come. May God help you to do that, help all of us, to live a life of following Him, a life that brings glory to Him and blessing to others. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for this great passage and this great example of Levi. He's an example of what we ought to do following you, but really he's also an example of your grace and your mercy and your power, just as that paralytic was, whose sins were forgiven. He did nothing to obtain that. That was all of your grace, just as the power to walk was given to him. He didn't earn that. He didn't enable himself to do that. And Levi did the same. He walked, as it were, because of the grace of God. He became a man forgiven and following Christ by your sovereign grace. And we confess that as well. We thank you for that and what you've done in our lives. May we continue by your grace to be men and women that follow Christ and live for him. We pray these things in his name. Amen.